okay recording and now we i go back to just a second uh yeah okay oh can so you see that Florian has appeared so he, he's here now ah uh, he is so so maybe he can tell us uh something about aldo van eyck <laughs> Because you mentioned him uh, two or three times, I've heard you. Yeah, no, I cannot tell you too much about him, honestly. I mean... Uh, no, no, I was uh, talking about the playgrounds, because we arrived at this quotation from uh, Gaston Bachelard, talking about childhood that can always flare up again within us, like a forgotten fire. So uh, we were talking about uh, uh, the playfulness uh, present in uh, some aspects of the Dutch culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, in general, I think it's it's very child friendly and it's a really good place for kids to grow up. I mean, this is actually one of the few things I regret uh, leaving the Netherlands and coming here to Indonesia, um, especially raising our, our kid, right? Because uh, when we left, he was uh, six years old and now he's uh, turning 12 this year. And... Um, yeah, I mean, going to this to school there, it's it's simply relatively easy. You know, you pack the kid on a bike, you go to school, you come, and then the kid tells you, "Hey, I'm going to play to today with this, or can this person come over?" And then you make a couple of pancakes, and, and you know, that's it, easy. Then you go out, and uh, in our case, uh, in 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 Rotterdam, and then, you know, there's a, a lot of um, a lot of yeah possibilities to play or or hang out uh, there was one playground which i really loved and the kids loved it's called spaledness um it's a mix of wordplay of uh wilderness and play so spale is play and uh, this was an amazing playground it was just like a big mud pool where they could climb around and, and, and sort of get dirty within the city because i mean this is simply something um i guess city kids are uh, sort of lacking uh, which comes back to our discussion yesterday of the um, urban versus the, the rural. So you bring some sort of rural uh, experience of playing in mud and dirt um, into the city. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of great initiatives um, like that. And as you know, I mean, me coming from, from, from Germany, I mean, we also have great playgrounds, but a sort of, um, I, I felt a, there's a particular freedom for kids in, in the Dutch culture for growing up and experimenting and trying out and trying to become uh, um, their own people. And yeah, yeah it's it's great, great opportunity there for kids. But would you say that um, uh, there is a certain pragmatism in, in, in the Dutch culture? Yes, for sure. No, but this is very interesting that on one hand you have pragmatism and on, on the other hand, you have playfulness, because mm. many people uh, divorce them. Many think, mm -hmm. well, how could I be playful when I have to be pragmatic? And those who are uh, playful think, well, I cannot be pragmatic because I love to play. But it seems that, that in, in the Netherlands, uh, 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 somehow uh, uh, there is a conjunction that you have at the same time uh, uh, pragmatism uh, and, and, and and playfulness. What do you think? Uh, it's very interesting because um, we were discussing, uh, when was this? I think it was also yesterday after we talked. Um, I remember one of my, uh, the early lectures um, in, in the University of Applied Sciences in Munich when I was studying architecture, which stuck to my head and which I was really impressed with, with was, um, um, Jakob von der Reis uh, came over from NDRD and gave a lecture. And this was probably 2001, 2002, shortly after the uh, Hanover Expo in Germany, where they made this uh, amazing stack. Um, also very playful landscape, right? The sort of uh, heterotopian space. And so far, I mean, architectural education was always very serious, you know, the plan and the section and... Um, you know, yeah, simply serious stuff. It was not fun. And then I pulled all my um, bravery, bravado together and, and, and wanted to talk with him after the lecture. And actually, the only thing I wanted to tell him was so, um, 
impressed that uh, I wanted to say like, oh, wow, it must be really fun to work in your office because this actually, you know, what, what sort of that was the, the quintessence of the lecture um, by Jakob, you know, that you do somehow serious stuff, uh, pragmatic architecture, but it's very playful the way you arrive there. And, and sort of this playfulness leads to this um, incredibly uh, creative output. So, um, yes, there is, I don't know, in, in terms of architecture, this is, um, I never could completely understand because on one hand, um, I mean, if I now compare Germany and, and, and the Netherlands, you know, the, the architecture is much more playful, much more experimental to a certain degree. Um, but I think this also has to do with the building budget because um, it does not, they don't put so much money into the buildings as, as in Germany, you know, so, um, so, so I mean, you think uh, a lower budget is actually connected with playfulness? Yes, for sure. And also, oh, but that's also, a very interesting thought. Please elaborate. Yeah, it is, uh, has to do, I think, with, with, the, with the lower budget. If, if the budget is a little bit lower, then uh, if things go a little bit wrong, you know, uh, and you don't expect that this high level of, of, of details and um, this high level of technical perfection if a building has a lower budget, right? So you can be also much more open to experimentation, I think. Versus, you know, German architecture is a little bit like a Mercedes Benz, you know, everything has to, it's expensive and everything has to sit, but it's not a very innovative car um, um, as such. And um, also what I think is also um, very interesting is um, the responsibility, the liability of the so the German architect is liable for everything from A to Z, right? And if something goes wrong with the building, um, then uh, the owner, the client, comes first to the architect and the architect has to prove um, whose mistake it was. Was it his planning mistake or was it a mistake from the, from the constructor or whatever? Um, in the Netherlands, very often, um, architects don't design to the utmost um, detailing meaning um, they don't have this much of, of liability and responsibility, so they can also be more playful in a way. Because if you have to think of hat that you know every detail needs to sit and fit because otherwise it's leaking, and if it's leaking, you are paying with your liability insurance. Um, you know, then you have a completely different, then you have an attitude of safety and risk management towards design, versus when you're freed of that, then you have more an, uh, an attitude of, of Okay, this is my part, and um, but you know how it is actually um, completely worked out. I draw a couple of details, but then the general contractor is more or less responsible for that. Um, so in, in, this, in, in, in bigger in bigger projects, and I find this also very interesting because on the one hand, you know, you as an architect, you want to have this sort of complete control, and then you have these absolutely amazing uh, details, but um, it can also be very limited versus you know, on the other hand, uh, you don't have this complete liability. Um, maybe this, these details are not as good, but then you can also be a little bit more more relaxed about, um, you know, um, not being worried that that, that um, uh, yeah, that things go a little bit wrong because it's not your, it's out of your hand. It's not your responsibility in a way. So, um, I mean, the Dutch architecture from this sort of double Dutch era. Um, or this golden Dutch era, or however we want to call this, uh, from the mid nineties on, you know, um, yeah, I think this is remarkable uh, what sort of offices also with public funding came out of the Netherlands, right? Because it was, um, yeah, a lot of these, these young offices could step out and I don't know exactly how this funding model worked, but I mean, they, and L architects, uh, MV, RDV, um, you know, all these, these, these guys, which are, or some of them uh, are big now, you know, they, they were younger than uh, Dana and me, and, and they started the offices and could land some, some big projects. Um, so, yeah, there, is a, there, there was a, or is, I don't know, um, a climate of, of experimentation, you know, in a way. So, you know, uh, the paradox is that usually, you know, the excuse for, uh, you know, uh, non-experimental work is the absence of uh, sufficient money. Usually people think that the more money you have, 
the more playfully you can allow yourself to be. But what you are saying is that in, in the case of the Netherlands, it seems that exactly because maybe the budget was a little bit lower compared to the one in Germany, uh, uh, somehow uh, the architects allow themselves uh, levels of experimentation uh, which were higher. Yeah, because not everything has to be perfect, right? If you have this budget and then, uh, you know, um, this, this, if you have this fantastic high budget then everything needs to be perfect, every, everything needs to fit. But if you have a lower budget, then you always can do a little bit of tinkering around. You can do some little bit of bricolage, you know, and then uh, nobody's angry about it. And of course, it's like extremely reductive what I'm saying, but um, yeah, you're a little bit more free so to speak because if if it's if it's not 100 percent you know it still works but you know then then you know you also don't have this budget you don't have this super enormous monetary um responsibility and i mean you see it also again coming to our background you mentioned in our micro libraries there are also um, our fields of experimentation because um we get the clients or we get um, the project and we get the funding for the project. So, and these projects are not so big and they're not so expensive. The microlibrary Beamer was around um, 50,000 um, US dollar. Uh, it's 80 square meter. Um, okay, it, it needed some renovation due to some um, mistake, but you know, that I think maybe we, we can also tie it down a little bit to, to, to the culture and the extent, uh, expectation of, of clients within this culture, um, uh, how, how architects can operate and, and navigate a little bit there. And maybe Germany is a little bit of a, uh, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, yeah, maybe Austria not so much. But, um, they're looking very much into the, the, the technical perfection of the building. Does it make sense? Anyone else wants to say something about, uh, let's say, childhood and architecture? Uh, well, I had an idea when you mentioned the church, uh, the churches. Uh, I recently read a couple of, uh, well, I saw a couple of um, converted churches into skate parks. So I thought that even though churches are meant to be serious and uh, connected to religion, they still have a playful side, uh, thinking about the stained glass windows and so on, that could provide some play there of light or that can help with the converted churches. I, I saw that there was a church in Netherlands, one in, uh, in Spain as well. So basically they have the uh, power to be converted into <laughs> something playful as well. I'd like to add to Anna actually, that's interesting uh, observation. I mean, in the Netherlands, the churches have become cultural spaces actually. So they in a way, I mean, since there are not so many believers anymore uh, in the Netherlands and in Europe, um, I mean, these places have become uh, cultural spaces and cultural spaces is that to celebrate, you know, the, the Ludens again and uh even and then i would like to compare the other part of the world such as in the south global south where people are still believers they go to churches they go to mosques and these are really hardcore religious spaces but then outside they have these photo spots you know again to celebrate on instagram that they have been to church with the family so that is a, there is always a um a, 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 a place to do this to 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 do something funny probably to to keep it light and simple thank you okay let's move forward let's see if uh, i mean let's move forward but i'm afraid no no it works uh, sometimes i'm afraid that my old laptop doesn't function well but now another quotation from gaston bachelard because today is his birthday about the subconscious well, in a way, it is connected with the previous one. The subconscious is ceaselessly murmuring, and it is by listening to these murmurs that one hears the truth. 
what do you think what what do you think he meant by this uh, ceaseless murmuring what is this murmuring maybe maybe it's exactly this uh, the childhood that always flares up again within us like a forgotten fire in other words the subconscious that he mentions here is sending us sporadic if not continuous sporadic uh, murmurs sporadic uh, impulses sporadic signs that, that, that there is something genuine within us uh, maybe buried under layers of i don't know what you know and uh, and uh, and they actually speak, speak the truth so again what he says is not so unique you know many people think about, think about this but i just crossed my mind uh, you know erasmus of rotterdam who was probably the you know the the paradigmatic uh, uh, scholar who also wrote in praise of folly so here you have a great scholar <clears throat> meaning a very serious scholar who also understood the, the value of play and even the value of so-called foolishness. And, and, and this is beautiful, I think, because you combine the seriousness of work and, and, and uh, you know, uh, yes, uh, very serious concerns with, with playfulness or these murmurs of the subconscious. Because in the subconscious resides that that very child that he talked about previously, and that very child that Brancusi said when when that child is 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 uh, uh, is not uh, alive, we are dead. In other words, we, when we are not children any longer, uh, we are not alive any longer. So, but unfortunately, at least in some parts of the world maybe in many parts of the world, society and the way life is, uh, tries to restrict the child because the child could be dangerous. You know, that subconscious could be dangerous. I remember in a beautiful film by Ingmar Bergman, Fanny and Alexander, the id to talk in, uh, in the Freudian, uh, using the Freudian language, meaning the subconscious, id. Uh, was uh, symbolized by um, uh, Ishmael, uh, uh, one of the two brothers, and he was, uh, 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 how to say, imprisoned in his cell. And he says, you know, I'm dangerous. They, they lock up my door. But that's what the subconscious is, is that dangerous force that if it's not locked up, could bring in some disorder, so-called disorder, but creativity and even truth have to do a lot with that so-called disorder. And so how could you have playfulness if you don't have that so-called murmuring or disorder that subconscious, the subconscious is, uh, is continuously generating? I, you know, this is the role of art, actually. In fact, art is that murmur. You know, art is telling us through Van Gogh and through so many beautiful artists who who try to compensate the 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 the, the, the sternness of, uh, of uh, you know so-called serious life with uh, with with the untold story and the un untold story is told by art and some some by 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 good architecture if we are to talk about architecture but architecture is not so playful out of all the arts uh, maybe is. Um, by the na by its very nature, somehow, uh, you know, uh, inhibited uh, sometimes, at least. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally agree on that one, that it is limited because it has um, always to feel, fulfill a purpose, you know, otherwise, I mean, it would be, uh, we would only build follies, but as soon as we have to house people and uh, so many aspects come into play as, um, you know, safety and, and, and shelter and so on and so forth. Of course, then um, you can't be as free anymore as, let's say, somebody uh, who's creating a sculpture or a, a performing art and so on and so forth. Because, you know, in the worst case, um, it might go wrong, but doesn't hurt anybody. But um, now coming back to this uh, idea of, of the childishness and the child's play and this murmuring, I think, I mean, kids are simply probably 
more directly connected to their subconscious, right? Uh, they are not able to suppress it yet, or not able to 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 tune it out. So whatever comes to the mind, they they act out, and if they are angry, then they're not able maybe um, to control that. And um, so maybe this um, ceaseless murmuring is just like that's what we what is on the on the um, beneath the surface, which is a little bit uh, suppressed. And I think our Western society, mm. the Christian society, uh, has a very great tradition of um, trying to suppress this and give everything a purpose. You know, uh, so the 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 idol, the not purposefully uh, act of doing something, the playing is 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 sort of forbidden, is frowned upon. Uh, reminds me a little bit um, to Umberto Eco. I mean. I've read only one one book by him, but I mean this great movie with Sean Connery, The Name of the Rose, right? Where um, people are dying in the cloister, and at the end of it, it is, turns out that um, the blind uh, abbot of the monastery, uh, monastery was uh, putting poison or hiding a, a, a Greek comedy, right? Because he was um, so against laughter, because it was sort of the representation of the sin and the representation of of, of the devil or, or you know so that uh, he tried to get rid of this book um, and, and that shows a little bit our culture and, and the idea of, of purpose and the idea of um, you're an adult now and you're an adult you have to behave accordingly and, um, yeah this is I think where we, we lose a lot of things maybe the more creative people amongst us are able to uh, cling on on their child, childishness or playfulness and, 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 and child memory and, and keep this connection more alive, you know, they don't uh, stifle it that much. But what, what do you think uh, about uh, Le Corbusier's thought that the problem in life is not to remain childlike but to become childlike? I mean, come on, Le Corbusier, I mean, you should not talk. I mean, he first starts out as a big rationalist, and then uh, after a while he realizes this is not the right way. And then you see... Right. This, uh, <laughs> then he so see, he became then, playful. Exactly. He became playful also to agree where we say, we could say yeah, he's a little bit childish, you know. I mean, why does this old, older man at that time uh, need to pose in, in, in swim trunks uh, and make photos to just to prove that he's now more playful or what? I mean... Um, uh, well, he I, was I, drunk, I, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> could be, could be. Yeah, but I mean, uh, with him, it seems like he, he made a, um, a lot of turns, which is which is okay. I mean, I um, I don't judge him by that, but I think um, being judgmental in general is a, is, a, is a problem, you know, or or um, also sort of being in possession of the one and only truth, you know, and um, telling everybody else that what they have to do and what they have to think and what they have to believe. Um, this is one of these big problems, I think, in our society and also in the architecture of education, in a way. You know, I mean, remembering studying at the, the Berla High Institute, you know, and uh, listening to PV, um, his, his truth about um, certain things in architecture, uh, yeah. I mean, I was always thinking, yeah, I'm not so entirely sure if there's not the, why can, well, why is it always, I define something and then the rest is wrong. Why is it not just like, okay, you can accept that somebody else has a different opinion and uh, let let this person just do what they want to do, you know? So this, um, I think this is also a little bit of an issue and this is also what, what I don't understand uh, with, with Le Corbusier, you know, that, um, there's only one way, and then all of a sudden I change my mind, and then, you know, is this is this then is it that is it that or you know? But that's because he began to have some sympathy for the for the donkey. The the, the donkey made made Le Corbusier more playful. Yeah, but I mean, also when he talked about, I mean, the house is a machine for living, right? Right. Uh, maybe he re he realized at a certain moment that he became a a, a robot and then a uh, robotnik is also like you know this uh, virgin slave. But 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 Florian, but he made ar architecture for enslaving people rather than freeing people and maybe this was Florian a Florian mm -hmm. did you ever see pictures of the of the town where he was born? 
No. Good. <laughs> because <laughs> because no, but this explains everything. If you look at the at, at, at pictures of the town where Le Corbusier was born and where he spent his childhood, because we talked about, then you'll understand him perfectly. It is mm. an unbelievable uh, 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 display of, uh, of uh, urbanistic uh, morosity and, 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 uh, and almost surreal control. I mean, if you see those buildings that are aligned, I mean, the poor, the poor uh, Le Corbusier, he, I'm sure he, he, something uh, traumatic happened to him. I'm not trying to excuse him for his uh, uh, anomalies later on in life, but uh, truly the, the childhood is important. If you grow up in, a, in, a, in an environment that is um, tolerant and uh, you know, playful, there is a good chance that you'll become playful too. But if you grow up in that terrible uh, town in Switzerland where he was born, I mean, just look on, on the web and you'll understand immediately what I'm talking about. It's the most mm. inhuman uh, uh, little town I, I ever saw. Uh, so, you know, it took him some time to free himself, to let the murmur, murmurs of his subconscious uh, come to life. I mean, if you talk about child and, and, and childhood and keeping playful um, and, and uh, open and this creative... Um, moment then immediately um shakta t comes to my mind you know with uh, these great movies um, which movie uh, playtime for instance or mon oncle shakta t yeah i didn't uh, see it no oh you have to this is this is you will love this you watch playtime and watch mon oncle um it's amazing this is um uh, i don't know if you could call it comedy but this is like he was a big um, Critique on the on on yeah, the on the rationalism and the modernism. So in, for playtime, he rebuilt a part of a, of a city of a modernist city, you know. And uh, Shaktati is interacting with these modernist spaces and is con it's constantly colliding with it. And everybody else is functioning within this grid system, within these yeah. uh, expectations and and so on and so forth. But he is like Shaktati is immersed there. Eh? It's 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 a must to to for architects. Yeah. Also for politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can uh, tell a little bit more. Uh, uh, well, the 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 um, I have all the uh, 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 all the movies that uh, Shakti uh, Tati has uh, uh, had made, and uh, and they are, uh, they are great, uh, and it's it's a response on the. Um, uh, on the society, of course, but also on uh, on art, on architecture, and on, uh, on on the way how we uh, cities uh, uh, create. Uh, his, his most famous film is uh, movie is um, what's the name? Uh, sh uh, the um, the, uh, the paradise. The paradise. What is it? A jour de fête. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. But and this is one of the early one, right? Where he yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. the the, the postbode. Um, yeah, it? the postbode, and, and, yeah. and it's 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 great. But um, I have to say, I I, I must leave the, uh, the 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 meeting, and I like to thank uh, Dan uh, for his enthusiasm. Um, but I, I I have to go uh, to 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 my family. Uh, again, thank you very much, and I appreciate it to, to, to have the possibility to participate. We, we thank you, and maybe we'll, we'll see each other again. Okay. Thank you have very a, much. Okay, thank you very much, and bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye. Bedankt. Leuk, om te moeten. Okay. Hoi. Tot de volgende keer. Ja, tot de volgende keer. Doei. Hoi. Uh, it was nice. Could you please say it again? <laughs> Dewey? Dewey? Dag? Yeah, what does it mean? Bye? So, or... Yeah, yeah, bye bye. Do we? To the bye -bye. Here? Do, do, do you bye. both? Uh, Daliana and uh, Florian, you speak. You both speak uh, Dutch, I think, no? No, no, I don't. The, 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 oh, well, um, unfortunately, Andre already left, but I don't know. The Netherlands doesn't make it easy for non-Dutch to speak Dutch, seriously. 
I, when I was admitted at OMA, I told Rem Kohlhaas, hey, I would like to learn Dutch. And then he said, oh no, it's a waste of time. <laughs> Stop using this office. That's what he said. So <laughs> time, my Dutch was better before I went to the Netherlands. <laughs> well, I, I have to tell you, it intimidates me, the language, because I don't know, it's something about the way it is uh, written and pronounced. Uh, I don't know, I think it's a difficult language, no? No, it's, I think it's simpler, easier to learn uh, than German. The grammar is a little bit more like the English grammar. And um, it doesn't have, um, yeah, the, the, the grammar is not that complex. Maybe the pronunciation is a little bit. But I mean, the only reason why I'm able to speak it is because it's then again relatively close to German. And if you live there and you're a little bit interested and just start talking, then you can learn it by, by, by listening. At least this is what happened to me. It's probably, like I said, you know, you're Romanian, you probably speak Italian, right? Or if you would be long enough in Italy, um, then you would pick it up easily. Yeah, but Daliana lived for 12 years in the Netherlands and she says that she doesn't know Dutch. Yeah, 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 that's a bit embarrassing, actually. I, I, I spoke a bit of Dutch for, for ordering food and just daily, for, for doing the tax, for doing the tax in the Netherlands. But uh, socially and uh, professionally, I, I do not speak Dutch. Well, maybe yeah, it has to do also with the temperament. You know, you, you, you have people who know more than what they claim they know. And uh, because some people are more introverted and, you know, uh, anyway. I mean, this, the, the funny thing, of course, about the Netherlands and not, um, you know, this is this is a little bit this 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 discussion about uh, multi multicultural uh, aspects of of tolerance. How tolerant is a society, and is a society really tolerant or is a society uh, ignorant? Um, because you know, look, if you go to France, for instance, um, there's no way you don't uh, speak French, you know, you or you don't get around at all. So there is a very big uh, impulse towards you to learn the, the language. So, this, uh. so in the Netherlands, um, there isn't. So um, everybody can speak English to a certain degree. And that means like, um, you know, even if you start talking in, in Dutch and they hear that you have a non-Dutch accent, they sometimes answer in English and they don't even give you the chance to try it out. And we always had this um, this joke that um, you know if you come uh, to uh, to a supermarket usually and there is a a, a beggar or a chunky uh, asking for money you just like say in English I don't understand the language you know that just doesn't work in the Netherlands because a beggar or chunky is in, in perfect English telling you that that doesn't matter and he still wants his money from you, you know? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Now, what a surprise that this gentleman of whom you, you, you knew or you know, uh, stepped in. I don't know how he, I don't know how he knew about this uh, Zoom uh, thing, you know. So he, he, he was the first one to come and he said, I'm a politician. I, I, I have been a politician, but he, in a very modest way, he also said I was the director of this museum of architecture or something like this. Do you know of him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the name is, is very well known. Yeah, he's really famous. I think I've, I don't remember if I've come across him or not, but I'm, I'm sure um, within my career, his name was mentioned uh, as a decision maker. I mean, he was the first director of the Netherlands Architecture Institute. And as Florian mentioned, I think, when was it, in the 80s, 90s, the Dutch architects were very much supported by, by, by the Ministry of Culture. And that includes having the Netherlands Architecture Institute, which is non-existent now. It's called Het Nieuwe Institute, the new institute, because they merge architecture with other uh, creative industries. Uh, but also the Stimulering Funds for Architecture, which is a, a, a fantastic fund for architects to do whatever sort of they want. You know, this is also one, one, one aspect, I think, about um, being playful or being allowed to be playful is um, how much how 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 much is the wealth in the society distributed? Because if you know everybody has um, um, food and medical um, 
is taken care of to a certain degree, then you can also have the luxury. If you don't have to struggle for the bare minimum on, on, a, on a daily basis, then you also have the luxury or the, the, the possibility to care for other things, you know, and allow people to be playful. And, um, you know, uh, when I see this current uh, political development of, of um, yeah, reshuffling of wealth um, towards less and less people have more and more, and the rest is struggle, struggling, then, um, you know, you cannot, you then have to first and foremost take care of your, of the needs of survival and you can't simply be playful anymore you know you have to become serious and uh, i find this is a this is very much a, it's a pity it should not happen you know did you receive today arch daily because there is a visual material about uh, the two sides of, of, of urban uh, you know societies uh, seen from the sky and on one hand you see how the poor live and very close to them. In fact, uh, you know, almost, uh, you know, next door, the rich. And mm -hmm. it, it's unbelievable, you know, in, uh, in uh, India, in Mumbai, in, uh, in Mexico, where you have simply a schism. On one hand, people who are, you know, barely surviving. And on the other hand, uh, you know, people who are, you know, doing uh, well, you know, and, yeah, these, these discrepancies are almost unbelievable, you know. Yes, I have the email open. I mean, it reminds me a little bit to this book, which we also uh, read at the Bella, which was called Splintering Urbanism. Um, um, it's very interesting because it talks exactly about these um, infra infrastructure within cities, which are bypassing um, completely quarters where people live and, and infrastructure like roads, um, you cannot get off the highway to, to enter, so these people are totally locked in place. Um, electricity and, and so on and so forth. And yeah, we see this very much in Jakarta, I must say. You know, that you drive along the highway, you get off the highway, then you arrive at a shopping mall. The shopping mall is built in such a way that you cannot enter this mall without uh, having a car because it's not made for pedestrians to enter, right? So, uh, the separation of, of people is um, what is your level of mobility you know and um, that those who invest money in, in infrastructure and, and transport um, skip entire parts of cities and entire parts of towns and um, I mean you have been living in the US for a very long time but um, I was only so far uh, had the chance to visit New York and, and LA but when I saw LA I was completely shocked because I mean, I, I thought I'm in a third world um, developing country, parts of LA, this is like, this is, you know, this, this is the richest country on earth, the most powerful country on earth, and then people live there, like, uh, yeah, in, in a developing country, not far from it. So I was very uh, fascinated in a way, or in a, on a astonished in a very weird way that, um, that develop the, I mean, this, uh, I say it now politically incorrect that the third world is embedded in the first world in the US, you know, in form I, I totally agree, Florian. I totally agree. I, I was astonished when I, when I visited, uh, um, uh, well, I wanted to go to Cincinnati and I took the bus from New York and in, uh, in uh, Cleveland I had a, a uh, an altercation with the uh, people there. There was a clear discrimination against me because I was white. And mm. uh, actually, they didn't allow me to take the bus, the bus that I had a ticket bought for. So I, I had to kill some hours because I had to return to New York. I lost that bus. It left without me because I was white. If you can believe it, the discrimination works in both ways in the United mm. States. Anyway, mm -hmm. so yeah. I, I went. I, I, I went to walk for the, you know to kill some hours. I couldn't believe my eyes. You mentioned the third world is actually the fourth world or the fifth world. I mean, the level of poverty, of destitution, of uh, of despair. You walk for miles, seeing nobody, seeing broken windows, uh, shacks because I cannot call them buildings. 
uh, you know, we win those blocks with, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, panels. I mean, really what Hollywood does is uh, a big lie. Hollywood, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hollywood is a cancer. Hollywood mm. is, uh, conquered the world with all kinds of superficial uh, seductions, but it doesn't tell the truth about, uh, about, the, about the country where it was born and where it resides. This culture mm. of the red, uh, red carpet, you know, and the glamour and the, you know, the Oscars. Come on, no serious director uh, makes a film in Hollywood. You know, uh, all the great directors uh, avoided Hollywood, including American great directors. Uh, so, you know, it, it really the, the, the cultural colonization of the world by these uh, mammoth uh, institutions, which are actually uh, interested only in money, you know, is uh, they are not interested in beauty or truth, you know, and uh, anyway, you know these things, but uh, it is entirely true that the level of poverty in the United States is, I mean, it is alarming. And, and you know, in Chicago, I lived for six or seven years in Chicago, there are areas in South Chicago where if you go, well, first of all, in, in, in South Chicago, about five people die every day because of shooting. They shoot each mm. other in despair. Mm. Mm. Around five people. There are intersections where, you know, you are at high risk of being uh, uh, killed and in the proximity of University of Chicago. So anyway, mm. um, yeah. But so, I mean... I, please. Uh, no, I think well, no, but I mean, I mean, you're absolutely right, and I think the, there's a big cultural difference in the, between Europe and, and, and the US. And Europe is maybe a little bit sort of on almost mediocre, you know, currently sort of the mediocrity. So everybody needs to be a little bit the same. It's a little bit of a sometimes conformity, which I also uh, not very much agreeing upon. Uh, whereas in the US, is is um, the winner takes it all, right? So uh, from the dishwasher to the millionaire uh, mentality. Uh, Which, yeah. of course... <laughs> Florian, Florian, allow me wait. to say something. Allow yeah, me wait, to let, say... Let, 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 let me just finish the sentence. Um, but um, this is also a very single-sided um, uh, worldview because, of course, you have some outstanding examples, but, you know, nobody talks about the rest, you know, the millions who are left behind and, and did not make it, you know. But only uh, they only focus on this one or this handful of winners, and everybody is striving for that. Uh, Florian, uh, Florian, let me tell you something. Let me say something about the so-called winners. I'm talking about the king of pop. I'm talking about the king of rock, and I'm talking about the queen of, 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 of sensuality or the queen of the silver screen. That is, yeah. I am talking about Elvis Presley. I am talking about Michael Jackson. And I'm talking about Marilyn Monroe. They all died in the very same way, in their own vomit, in their own bathroom. So when, it, when two kings and a queen, so-called winners, you know, in the, in the perspective of the American dream, die in their own vomit in the bathroom and being young, this does say something about the shallowness of the so-called American dream because the so-called winners are not winners at all. I mean, mm -hmm. again, we are talking about two so-called kings and one so-called queen, and they died the most miserable deaths. So obviously something is wrong there because, you know, why would two kings and one queen die, die in the same way and in that very miserable way? Why? Because at bottom is a big lie, that's why. You know, uh, they were not happy, they were not accomplished, and they were not winners. Just because they had millions, it means nothing. I mean, Mike Tyson uh, was very honest when he said uh, it's, very, it's very tough to, be li uh, to, to, to live, to be alive. And so-called fame means nothing. He was honest. Mike Tyson was honest. The boxer was more honest than the promoters of uh, you know so-called uh, American dream. Mm -hmm. No, I mean I totally agree. But uh, on a personal level, um, I mean uh, you have been there seven years um, in Chicago. Why did you stay so long? 
Well, because I, I was a, a dreamer. I, I wanted to build the proximity of Frank Lloyd Wright and Miss and, uh, and uh, Louis Sullivan. And because I opened a, a, you know, some so-called small art gallery, architecture gallery, and I was working something else in order to pay the rent. And uh, anyways, uh, I'm not going into the details now. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I know the United States, although I never went to yeah. the, Although I never went to the west side, I, I only I, I lived for more than 20 years in New York City and six mm. or seven years in Chicago. But I never, I actually never traveled, except I took once the train from New York to Denver, Colorado, 48 hours. 48 hours in the train. <laughs> you know, I mean, the trains in the United States are pathetic, totally <laughs> pathetic. I mean, they are so primitive and so slow. It's unbelievable. <laughs> anyway, uh, not to talk about the buses. But anyway, mm. we, we, we didn't meet today to talk about the states. Let's go back to Bachelard because I want to ask you, especially you, because you, you are practicing architects. How could you let the subconscious manifest itself in your projects or in architects? In what way? Yeah, it's, it's just, this is, this is a very difficult question how to do that. I'm not sure if I'm able to answer this. Um, I mean, um, well, maybe you should drink something then, then, you, then you would be able to, to verbalize. I'm, I'm out of alcohol. No, um, what Daliana recently did, and maybe she can explain a little bit about it, and then not all, I, I have to talk only is. Um, because we have this Instagram account and, you know, the social media monster needs to be fed. It's constantly demanding for um, food in form of pictures to be uploaded. Uh, so what she started is to look at our work and um, categorizing um, this work or elements, reappearing elements in our work. And one is uh, sort of the uh, Kuschelecke, so it's a German word for the cuddling corner, right? Um, the theatron, um, which is uh, Indonesian word for um, steps for seating and so on and so forth. And um, it's yeah, Greek. The theatron is Greek, sorry, not Indonesian. Oh, I, I thought you called it uh, the Latin based name, okay, or, or Greek based name, sorry. Okay, I thought it's uh, you don't use it in Indonesia, theatron, theatron. No, we call it theater, but uh, I mean, uh, these yeah, okay. are like, yeah, well, anyway, please explain. Okay. No, but uh, please go ahead, explain. So, uh, yeah, uh, because I think like play spaces, you know, this is maybe something where uh, such conscious comes to the foreground, you know, imagining um, with the micro libraries, you know, you're a kid, what would you like as a kid there, you know? And um, so maybe you can explain a little bit, Dana. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, Florian is designing a lot uh, in subconsciously four-dimensional at the same time. So he thinks about uh, engineering solution at the same time as programmatic solution. And at the same time as I think everything we've learned in architecture school about spatial archetypes, which could be of use, like, for example, uh, enclaves, um, spaces with steps, uh, a foyer, a kind of arcade, all those kind of like uh, spaces which brings, I, would, I, I wouldn't say joy, but sentimental value to the space, something that gives meaning to the space. And um, we are not a kind of architects uh, who are more like, um, uh, how, how do I say it, uh, artists or, 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 or showcase our work, you know, uh, like, how do I say it? Um, we we present our work as rationalist, programmatic architecture, I would say. But while doing that, we never forget about the sensitive spaces, these uh, spaces which feed to the to the kids, to the to the children, to the childhood, in the users. And we realized that probably after we did our work, we've been looking again, evaluate our designs, and actually, yes, it does have certain traits of these um, uh, ludic spaces, these, these playful spaces that try to engage the user to the 
to the familiar spaces that they've known to to the memories and to to the meaning actually of uh, uh, spatial meaningfulness probably so yeah very often uh, um yeah imagine being a kid and being there and what uh, would what would i like you know so um and then actually um you know when 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 we showed alun alun chichendo the, the park right this is a great thing to see and to watch how people start to um, use the thing you imagined and, and worked out but in a completely unexpected completely different way and how they become creative sort of uh, all of a sudden you, you start triggering them in a total unexpected way and then you try to learn and then for the next time you um, you know try to make this implicit knowledge uh, explicit in, in, in the next design iteration maybe it would be an interesting exercise you know to invite ourselves to just imagine an architecture house or whatever that is intimately connected with our uh, earliest childhood you know mm. without uh, having a client just just to try to descend in our own biography and in our own past at the very bottom and uh, like uh, florian said you know to to make something uh, architectural uh, an architectural something that would make that child that may be very very young child uh, uh, you know uh, resonate with it and, and 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 connect with it you know how how would that be you know i was born in a medieval town uh, i i grew up in the shadow of the cathedral which was on a hill in the center and uh, it marked me i i to this day i'm very sensitive to to the gothic to the middle ages uh, and uh, even to the cathedral and that's why maybe i like the manifesto by walter gropius i because yes the childhood is very important so i i wonder how daliana would do a project where she would allow the little kid in her to you know to just express herself as as much as possible and then Florian with his own experiences and everybody else here with his or her own experience. I, I, I do think there is great hope in that. Um, I, I agree with Kant who said beginnings are in, always in harmony with a human nature. And mm -hmm. the childhood is, is a beginning, you know. Anyway, what about this? Uh, I'm approaching the end here of the quotations. For we understand nature by resisting it. Now this is a, you know, a, a, a difficult one. You know, what do you think he meant? We understand nature by resisting it. I mean, on a very basic level, maybe it means. Um, I mean, let, let's put it that way. Maybe once we were part of the nature. Um, but then we developed all these tools to set us free from nature. And this is sort of a, an act of resistance or an act of uh, mastering nature, right? The, the idea of agriculture, that you're not uh, nomadic anymore and run behind the animals which you hunt, but you're able to uh, sort of um, produce your own food and, and, and you sort of set yourself free from the cycle uh, towards the point where we are right now so in a way we are completely resisting it because if it's too hot then we put an air conditioning on uh, if it's too cold we uh, we heat the room and so on uh, so uh, we in a way detached ourselves um, completely from this from this nature this is one of our big problems we have right now and um, um, yeah, so this is sort of in, maybe that very literal means like, you know, in order to be able to uh, resist it, you first have to understand what it is doing. So maybe on a scientific level. Um, what I found very interesting, again, uh, coming back to, um, to Peter Sloterdijk, is that we as, me uh, as people tend to see ourselves detached from our from our environment as because you know we, we are enclosed in this body and we are enclosed with our consciousness uh, we see ourselves as, as individuals but um, he describes um, the the uh, 
20th century um, as the beginning or the, 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 the mankind understood more and more the environment they live in. And uh, one cruel but a very interesting example is um, chemical warfare, uh, in the form of poison gas, which was employed in the, in the First World War, that we understood that actually so far in wars, um, we fought each other with a knife and we stabbed each other. So we took directly the life of each other. But then with the First World War, with the industrialization of war, we understood all of a sudden that man lives in an environment and we do not need to kill the man directly. We kill the, we make the environment, humans are living in inhospitable and make the environment kill them much more efficiently. And that was a sort of a really a, a great revelation for me to, to sort of, okay, you know, we always see us, ourselves as these individuals being completely detached, but, but we are not, you know? Um, so we, we, breathe and we, we circulate whatever particles um, float around. Um, so we absorb them and we, we get rid of it. So we are in constant exchange with our environment and, and we just don't see that anymore, you know? And that's, I think that's a, that's a big problem. But you, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright was very fond of, uh, of nature and of saying that, you know, the building, uh, should create an harmony with nature and with earth and so on. But uh, uh, a philosopher, his name, I, he's, he's very fashionable now, but I, I have great difficulties to pronounce his name. Uh, somebody told me who works in the office of uh, Fujimoto in Paris that uh, this philosopher said that you, we, all, we all talk about, you know, uh, embracing nature and receiving nature and so on, but maybe we should do the very opposite turn our back on nature. What do you think, what do you think that could mean? And, and returning to Bachelard, what do you think he meant by resisting nature? I mean, I personally think there are two natures, not just one. It's the external nature and it is the interior nature because there is a, there is a lake and a forest and the sky within ourselves, in our soul, in, in our, uh, uh, mind in our psyche and so there is what is outside is also inside so when you say resisting it meaning nature are you referring to the nature outside and only to that what about the nature within because no, I, it's a good point it's a very good point i didn't think about the nature within but this is almost then touching um the question of morality, you know, what makes, um, what distinguishes a human being uh, with, a, with a, a self-conscious being from an animal almost. Does it go into that direction? I mean, we're sort of in, uh, resisting our instincts. That's actually what I thought as well when I read the the quote about our inner nature, resisting our, su suppressing our uh, animal within or something mm. like that. But, but what I don't understand is that uh, isn't uh, partial art all about perception? So isn't that our, uh, you know, natural ability in human to to perceive like to sense so I, I i don't really quite understand this one what he's saying resisting ourselves i, I don't quite I, I don't understand it very well either uh, but maybe maybe what he means is what um, kierkegaard sir and kierkegaard said with that when we live, we live, must live moving forward. But in order to understand, we have to look backwards. So in order to understand nature, you have to distance yourself from nature because otherwise you cannot understand it. So in a way, this is true in many cases that you need some distance. Even in terms of love or romantic relationships, there is even a song which kind of makes me 
sentimental uh, where he says, uh, so I, I, I let her go. And when you let her go, exactly then you realize how much you loved her. When, when, when you let her go, when she, when she distances herself from you. So maybe, maybe yes, it's this paradoxical relationship that we, we kind of understand what nature is exactly when we are kind of far away from it. And because if we are immersed in it, we are together with it, but we don't really understand it. Maybe, maybe understanding means, uh, you know, yeah, it's connected in a way to a mental process that cannot take place when you are within it, you know. So, 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 so you mean like in, in order to obtain an objective standpoint and perspective, you cannot be part of the system, you have to be outside the system. Yeah, in a way, something like this, yes, when you are in the midst of it, you are consumed by, 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 by being in the midst of it, so you, you cannot contemplate it, you, you don't understand what's going on. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, no, it's just it's an interesting point, this is also a very interesting point of, of, of design work, you know, if you're working in a on a project and you're in a very big rush and you take all these design decisions, you sometimes start to lose overview, you know, you know, you need to step back and uh, obtain a, a neutral standpoint again, not reevaluate what you were doing. Um, the best is to, if you have the luxury to just, you know, put the work away for a week and don't look at it for a week and then go back and then you have fresh eyes and you're not part, you're not in the process anymore. You've stepped out of the process, which gives you this, uh, uh, distance for for evaluation. Well, I, I think I told you that uh, when I interviewed Wolf Prix uh, through Skype uh, for about one hour and a half, I asked him in the end, "What do you recommend, uh, architects and students?" And he said, "Don't think." And what what does it mean? What did he mean by "don't think"? Because I I mean I think I understand that there are there are various ways of thinking. It's not just that thinking with, uh, with reason. There is also another, or maybe there are several other ways of thinking. You can think even with your stomach or with your hand, you know, because even when you appear not to be thinking, something within you is thinking, but not with that enlightened, so-called enlightened uh, reason that we are so accustomed to. So, uh, I mean... I have a little bit, look, I don't know this uh, man personally. I mean, I only have seen um, his works um, then in, in, in Munich, the BMW um, right. building. Um, and I've talked with people who have worked there. And what I find very uh, irritating about him is that he plays the rock star and he plays this sort of oh I sit down and I'm the hippie and uh, play my guitar and, and, and I'm jamming and stuff like this but then he runs a practice where people are slaving basically their asses off till uh, one o'clock and two o'clock in the morning right and right. then he tells them they should be actually playing guitar and should be rock stars yeah without this so uh, what does it say? Is this is, is this cynical about the people working for him, or is this, uh, or does he maybe not want these people to work that much for him, or um, did he build a uh, uh, cult around him, around his his, his persona um, to make these people? So because I mean, he's, obviously he's benefiting from these sort of uh, circumstances that they are all um, working over hours and produce for him so how can you then say you know you should not think you know um, it, it sounds a bit like this you know you should not think you should relax and play your guitar and uh, but you know if, if everybody in his office would do that then there wouldn't be a, a BMW building you know there would be none of these buildings well Florian uh, an Italian critic Luigi Prestinenza told me once then never listen to what architects say so <laughs> <laughs> I mean there is some truth here, you know. I mean, uh, you know, he says one thing, but, uh, you know, we don't have to take it uh, really seriously, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe the higher they're up on this food chain or ladder, the less we should listen and then and, and take uh, what they say is as is, is real, yeah. yeah maybe man. just a P Although, PR machine. Although I do, I do have some kind of longing for, uh, for uh, you know, a kind of architect who 
the way he builds is the way he talks. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, I am disappointed when I see these statements, you know, uh, uh, thrown uh, at you with a nonchalance and, uh, and uh, be behind them uh, some, someone is hiding with maybe his own fears and his own vulnerabilities. When he visited uh, the university here in Bucharest, because he's a friend of the school, and he gave several lectures here. And uh, the last time I saw him, he was uh, he had a cane. He was uh, he had a problem with one of his legs, and he told us what happened. He he said, "Well, I always uh, loved uh, high-speed cars, and uh, one day a friend told me, well, Wolf, uh, you know." Uh, you always wanted to be avant-garde in the front of everybody to promote new ideas. How come you still run a car? You are supposed to run, run have a bicycle. So he said, I, I sold my Porsche and I, I, well, I'm sure he was able, he would have been able to buy a bicycle without selling his, his Porsche. Anyway, he sold his Porsche and he climbed on a bike and the first thing he fell to the ground you know, because of that malicious force against which he fought all his life, meaning gravity, and he broke <laughs> his leg. And then he said, I had to, all the money I got for the Porsche, I had to invest in the doctor to repair my, my uh, knee and, you know, my, my leg. And he still have trouble, had troubles with it. But um, by the way, it actually connects with Bachelard and with this quotation about resisting nature. Do you think architecture should uh, or could or is uh, trying somehow to escape gravity? Oh man, we had this discussion today about a project we're working about right now. Um, where the rationalist in me um, took uh, hold of me and then um, uh, Daliana brought me back to the right path and say like, uh, Fuck gravity, you know. Um. <laughs> All right, let, let me explain it, Florian, from a different viewpoint, maybe. We, we, hey, had, we just met a great client, and usually architects ask for this cantilever possibility that no clients would like to say yes to that because it's more expensive, it's against gravity, and so on. But this client asked for it, and um, I think we should embrace it. You know, whenever a client opens their hands for experimentation, we should take it. And if they cancel it, then we know it because it's because of the budget and, and late realization of reality. But um, that the, uh, a client is open to that, I think we should embrace it. And uh, I think it's always very fascinating. Um, okay, how, how Yona Friedman, for example, how Constant Newman House bring all the cities up to the sky as if graffiti doesn't exist because it does not exist on paper, in fact. But it's always very fascinating to imagine these cities fly, float, and structures uh, defy gravity. So um, yes, if possible, I think if there is budget and, uh, and if, if it's possible to imagine, we, we should try to resist um, all, every practicality that bring architecture to the ground, perhaps. But do you know uh, that uh, big cinema in uh, in uh, in in, um, in uh, South uh, South Korea built by Kok Himmelblau, with an immense canopy that floats that flies, and what's interesting about that project, you probably know it. Maybe I didn't uh, describe it uh, the best way, but. Uh, it, it's a spectacular building where truly you feel like a huge, huge building is, is ready to fly. And he said in the lecture that I attended that while they were building it, and in fact, uh, I don't know why I have this fear to touch uh, Zoom because I could show you the building, you know, just immediately going to Google Images. Should mm -hmm. I try? Should I risk my uh, the peaceful uh, peacefulness of Zoom? Uh, I, I guess let me try. I mean, come on. I, I advocate taking risks, and I'm even I'm afraid even to start Google. Uh, let me see where is Google now. It pretty much looks a bit like the BMW building, no? Like this. Uh, now it's much more uh, spectacular. Um, M much more, even okay. No, it's this actually one. unbelievable, and I, I I think you 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 know it because uh, it was published everywhere. 
But I will tell you something that I didn't know when I looked at pictures of the building and he, he told us something very, in a way, funny by the way of gravity. And uh, you will see immediately what, what, uh, what I'm talking about. Okay, Google images, and I, I type in um, uh, Kop Himalbrow. In Busan. Now, uh, South Korea, yes. Now, this is the building. Uh, I don't know if you see, uh, because I don't know any longer what you see, but... <laughs> Yeah, 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 we see it. It's there. Anyway, you see this corner here, which is truly very far away from the other corner. And yes, the, the, this part of the building is, uh, is uh, almost ready to take off. Well, he said that when, when they were building this building, while they were building this building, uh, the, the, the seismic uh, regulations in this city changed. They became more stringent. So... The, the, the building wouldn't pass the new regulations. So what he did was, uh, and this is kind of funny, in, in the earth, he, uh, he built a telescopic column, which automatic, automatically, in case of, uh, if the, the seismic activity was going above the, the, the limit, uh, would spring from, from underground, and, and like a magical cane, support this corner of the building. But it was hidden, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, uh, yes, you want to fly, but, uh, you know, gravity is not something you play games with because it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's actually, I, I love gravity because gravity, as I put it, is the only certitude that I have. I, I, I don't know about God, but I know about gravity. Gravity is uh, truly the only certitude I have. I, I don't have other certitudes. Anyway, um, but you know, uh, let me see. Yeah, you see, it is a spectacular structure and it was done with an immense amount of money, I'm convinced. And uh, you know, here we can talk about morality and about the ethics of construction. He doesn't care about that. He pushes, pushes to the limits of technology and the, and the pockets of the, of the clients to create something so-called spectacular. Uh, but, but this is, I mean, if, I, if I'm a cynic now, this is like, okay, this is the boomer, you know, who lives in this abundant world and he's the guy who gets a pension because the pension is still for him like the generation of my parents and after this the the banks and the vaults are empty um, morally as well as, 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 as environmentally i'm uh, yeah i'm not a great i mean look i understand and i don't want to say like um uh, i don't want to bring the playfulness down but this is somehow it's pure egomania this is not playful anymore you know this is mm -hmm. it's i don't know it's silly um, I in, understand in what you say. Yes, I understand. So it's, it's, it, this is irresponsible. I mean, you 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 can be. I mean, and then coming up with a telescope and and, and selling this as uh, being very proud of this. Yeah. No, no, I, I don't. don't know. I don't think he was too proud. But in a way, you see, you t we we play games with uh, with gravity, but gravity is is uh, is is grave. I mean, it's 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 uh, you know, even yeah, the fact. Even the fact that he fell from the bike, you know, it's it's ironic that you know <laughs> he, he always aspired towards a non-gravitational architecture. Uh, and but uh, look, uh, I I actually think that the Gothic cathedral, I actually think gravity is the is the very premise of architecture. I know it sounds paradoxical, but but I think a building should fly metaphorically, not 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 concretely or explicitly i mean look this is something also what i'm very fascinated by uh, by, by, by gaudi and uh, also by Fray otto you know with the catenary models and the catenary curves they strive towards the sky and uh, but they make they they sort of are very smart in the system to almost play with gravity in, in such a way that they sort of make 
gravity work for their own purpose, which I find very smart and very elegant. And then you can uh, get this uh, thin structures and these thin shells and this, uh, like the multi halle in Mannheim, and which is spanning enormously. And this is defying gravity by understanding gravity. This is what I see from Cole Pimmelbau is just brute force. This is fighting gravity. This is a conflict with gravity. And of course, you know, uh, we already discussed this the last time when you, when you showed uh, um, the other Austrian architect, which is probably a predecessor of, uh, uh, of Wolf Rix. Um, you know, this is their struggle. Uh, maybe it's okay, but it's, it's, for instance, not my cup of tea. You know, I'm more of a, you know, somebody who would, likes to understand the, the gravity and then work with it instead of trying to work against it. Because in the end of the day, you know, gravity is like the casino. The casino always wins. Well, at the end of the day, you fall from the bike. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, by the way of this, uh, um, a journalist in South Korea um, asked him uh, at the time when he built this to give five examples with buildings that must be seen by any architect or student. And he said like this, he said the, the Egyptian pyramids, uh, the temple of Hera at Pestum, that pre-Doric temple that moved so much, Goethe, Winkelmann, uh, Piranesi, and Louis Kahn, well, that was my addition. He didn't mention this for uh, great predecessors. So the pyramids, uh, the temple of Hera in Pestum, uh, the Guggenheim by, by uh, Frank Gehry in Bilbao, kind of predictably, a plane, um, he included a plane, uh, meaning a Boeing 747, I guess, I'm not good at, at planes. And the fifth one, the little church that he built uh, in his hometown, uh, uh, in Austria, uh, and with modesty, he included his own building between the five examples. But when he was here at the university, I, I asked him, what about Pestum? Because there's the heaviest building I ever saw. I didn't see the Egyptian pyramids, but uh, this pre-Doric temple moved me with this telluric force. And he said, no, 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 I didn't say Pestum. But I, that's what I read. Uh, so it's kind of funny that uh, someone who uh, wants to escape gravity mentions out of five examples of the most important architecture, two of, two of them are some of the heaviest. I mean, the pyramids <laughs> and the temple <laughs> of Pesto. So there are contradictions. Maybe Luigi Prestinenza was right. Never listen to what architects say because, you know, <laughs> Maybe he's in love. He's in love with gravity, and I saw recently a film uh, that he sent to the president of the university here, a DVD with his works. And at the at the end of the DVD, there was a, 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 a he visited the 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 house of his parents in that little town where he was born, and very interestingly, the house was left totally in disarray. In fact, it is invaded. It was invaded by vegeta vegetation. I mean, totally unkept, totally, with the exception of the facade, which was painted in pink, in pink kind of, you know, you know, in that sweet uh, aesthetics of a certain Austrian town. But once he opened the door, we entered into a state of total decay and ruin. And uh, I, I wrote then a text, I didn't mail it to him, but, uh, I thought of because, you know, someone who is so against gravity is actually someone who didn't come to terms with death and uh, with limitations, with the limits of life. And um, so be, behind the glossy terribilita, there is maybe a tre trembling child. That's my point. And I, I think what is also interesting, which we should maybe, I mean, discuss a little bit, um, or should not leave out of focus is if we talk about like architects like um, uh, the bigger firms like uh, maybe UN Studio, Saha Hadid, uh, Wolf Bricks, you know, when they, when they, at a certain moment when they have a certain scale um, and they have a, a, a lot of people, then they have partners, then they have, um, yeah, 
all these mouths to feed and they become a brand. And um, then they sort of start to solidify into a certain style, into something, a, a, a signature, which is rec uh, recognizable because this recognizability, you know, it's like a piece of art which you want to have uh, in your in your um, in your city uh, living room, so to say, this piece of, of some, this nice picture, this piece of art by by uh, Himmelblau or Rosadi. So I think at a certain moment, these people completely lose control of of their offices because the office starts to become its own uh, organism and its own mechanism. Uh, they don't have so much say anymore. This is my 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 hunch or my theory at last. Because when I look at, for instance, at the wonderful paintings and illustrations by Sarah Hadid, and what I then see, what came out uh, later and later and later, it seems more like you know um, the the becoming of the brand took over, and the sellability of this this, this brand as a recognizable uh, style and, 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 and signature becomes much more relevant. So even maybe, you know, till a moment uh, when it's too late and then um, this this ship or this this train is, is, is driving in a certain direction and you are the, the, the figurehead, but you cannot do anything about it anymore, which direction it goes. It's possible, yes. Yes, when it becomes too big, uh, yeah. Uh, paradoxically, you become um, almost inevitably marginalized marginalized by your own success actually yes 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 exactly okay let's go to the last quotation from uh, gaston bachelard if i find it uh, yeah i find it it's here and uh current slide okay it's this one and it's kind of connected with the previous one one must always maintain maintain one's connection to the past and yet ceaselessly, ceaselessly pull away from it what do you think of this one? Uh, maybe somebody else. Or somebody else. When I said you, one of, of, of the others. <laughs> we need to learn from the past and even mistakes of the past and try to evolve. That's what I think he means. You know what is very interesting? The word tradition has the same root with the word treason and not just in English and not just in Romania, also in French. Uh, and because it, it, there is some kind of complicity between a paradoxical compl complicity between uh, the act of uh, reverence for the past and uh, its betrayal. Uh, how do you explain that the word tradition is rooted in the same root from which sprang treason, or trahir in, in, in French. Uh, 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 and I think tradition, in order to remain alive, or maybe even better said, to become alive, it needs to continuously, yes, it's paradoxical. On one hand, you respect what was before you, but you also change it. And I have in mind uh, this image somehow, I don't know if it's... Uh, totally uh, correct this image, but I'm thinking of, of, of a young person, let's say at 18 or 20 or 21 or 19 or 22, who has to start his or her own life and lives, a, lives his or her parents and after a while turns his or her uh, head and towards the parents and maybe with tears in the eyes but continues to walk away. In other words, you have to emancipate yourself from those who made you, but, but, but at the same time, you have tears in your eyes, and at the same time, you turn your, your head towards them. So it's this paradox. You must always maintain the connection with the past, and yet you have to move away. Because if you don't move away, you become a... a, a, a a, a paralyzed uh, traditionalist, I'm talking about, you know, in uh, working in architecture. And if you move away without turning your head and without having tears in your eyes, you become a, a, a terribleist, this uh, enfant terrible who does things that are, uh, could be judged as irresponsible because they are not connected with what preceded, uh, preceded uh, them. So, 
uh, it, it's very difficult. Like I remember uh, the, uh, Kenneth Frampton saying about Carlos Carpa that he had an immense desire to remain within tradition, although his work didn't appear to be uh, traditional. But today, how can you do an architecture that is moving away from the so-called tradition and at the same time turn its back towards it, maybe with tears in its eyes? Uh, I, um, maybe Kenzo Tange was right, the tradition today is not, uh, uh, I mean, it, 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 maybe even the usage of the word is not appropriate any longer because what tradition, you know? Uh, 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 Wolf Briggs talks about uh, uh, that there is no context at all. And, uh, and uh, the tr traditionalists say, well, what are you talking about? There is only context. So it's the, the eternal dilemma, you know, you have to assert your life, you, you have to assert your time, you have to assert your usefulness. Uh, but, but at the same time, you cannot be completely fractured from what preceded you. So it's, it's, it's very difficult. I think Bachelard is right. You must con be connected with what preceded you and at the same time bring in something new. Create uh, something that is of your time, not of someone else's time. Uh, it's not easy uh, at all. I mean, mad architects, for example, who are, are, you know, described as being futuristic. Well, Mayan Song claims that he's actually a traditionalist, if you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this sort of, um, how do you say this in English? I forgot the word. Um, opposing elements uh, somehow work very 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 well in, um, in in very weird ways i mean for instance uh, when i think about the christopher alexander pattern language right uh, which is a book about a sort of a almost a catalog system i think or if i could describe it like that how to make a good architecture you know um in a way, is picked up by uh, computer programmers in a, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a model uh, how to make programs in form of modules and then combining these modules to a larger software system. But at the same time, it also is you now picked up by uh, Prince Charles and um, and is, is advocated for um, traditionalist architecture in the UK, and it was never his intent. So. Uh, So yeah, there is always this uh, element of, of um, the sort of high tech or uh, even avant garde, which then all of a sudden gets picked up by those who you do not uh, associate yourself with, and that's a tricky thing. <clears throat> by the way, of the word avant garde, I. Um... I don't know if I invented this word, but I thought of it, you know, that maybe a, a more appropriate word would be perigard. You see, though, you already know this by me, that I like to play with words. But the problem with avant-garde is that avant-garde means, uh, implies a front and a back. But what about the sides, the left side and the right side? They are left mm. out of, 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 uh, of, 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 they are left out. and. So yes, this this is this is very important because if you get flanked in a battle, then you lost. So peri guard for me is something that is at the periphery, either in the front or in the back or on the left or on the side. So it's a, almost like a circular kind of avant-garde, if I can say so. Anyway, this is just a digression, but. Um, Ah, there is so much to say and so little time, but, you know, um, should we, I mean, this is the last uh, slide I have with, 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 with the thoughts of, because we didn't do justice really to Gaston Bachelard, but, uh, we, <laughs> but, but, but I don't know. I mean, uh, if uh, Louis Kahn was right when he said that he could uh, 
um, you know, imagine or understand the history uh, the starting with volume zero or with a blade of grass, you can, you can actually, for, from a few quotations, you know, imagine some kind of web of thoughts that approximates, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, understanding that sometimes, you know, if you read all the books and every letter and every word, it doesn't mean necessarily that you understood better. I think, you know, uh, anyway. Um, so I want to say that tomorrow I I I, I want I, I want I really want to pay homage to these two women architects, um, Carmen Pinos and, uh, and uh, Benedetta Taliabue, uh, and um, it's it's the right time to do it because the end the month of June will end, and uh, they are very very interesting and even bio in the biography they have been the wives of the same man, quite a quite a good architect himself, Eric Mirais. And, and it's very interesting. It's actually, you know, someone could, uh, could, um, could do a PhD paper on this uh, conjugal triangle, you know, Enrico, Mir, Enric Mirais and uh, Carmen Pinos and Benedetta Taliabue. Usually in the past, talking about the past, uh, <laughs> Monsieur Bachelard, usually in the past when the husband died, the women kind of, uh, you know, remain anonymous and nothing happened, you know, they, but in this case, when the, once the man died, the women developed further and more beautifully than, than they were with him. And what is interesting, both of them, and they are both in the same city in Barcelona. So it's a very interesting case where two brilliant women married to the same man, the man dies, and the women continue to have their architectural practices, I actually don't know how they can afford to be in the same city, but they are. So it will be a great occasion to talk about Carmen Pinos and, uh, and, um, and Benedetta Taliabue uh, and, and see the, the big differences between them and also kind of the connection with, uh, with, uh, you know, with, 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 with Enric Mirais. So uh, I would invite you, if you have time tomorrow, uh, to talk about this, uh, this uh, very good architects. I'm, you know, Benedetta, Benedetta Taliabue is now in the jury for Pritzker Prize. And, you know, she might get it too, because, uh, you know, that's what happened to Aravena. He was first in the jury and then he got it. So maybe she will get it too, but it's not really important if she gets it or not. She's an interesting, uh, interesting architect. And so is Carmen Pinos. So um, tomorrow, as I said, I, I welcome you to, 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 you know, to look at their works. And soon we'll enter July. Ah, on, on the 29th, we'll talk about John Johansson, a very interesting North American architect. I don't have yet the PowerPoint presentation on him, but maybe Bruce Denzinger, uh, the, the engineer, will join us. He was his assistant at Pratt Institute. This, uh, uh, you know, the, Bruce is a very interesting man. He's an engineer, but he taught architecture together with, um, if I understood well, together with John Johansson at Pratt Institute in, in Brooklyn, um, New York. So we'll see. And, you know, some of you received that list. I, I was busy last night creating lists. My God, I, I, it even paralyzed me because now, now I have lists with all the so-called celebrations for the whole year, for every month. And uh, now that they are done, I, I, I almost feel like stopping doing this because it becomes too systematic and too, too, too predictable in a way. But when I see, a, when I look at the list and I see all those names of those exciting architects, I probably can't abstain to, to, to do something about them. So, but what I wanted to say, I invite you and David already uh, signed in for talking about the Catalan architects. Thank you, David. And I welcome anyone who wants, feels inspired to talk about a, an important, you know, architectural uh, you know, uh, practice. Yeah, let's do it. 
I, I have to tell you, today I was very disappointed and, and I, I really, uh, I, I was depressed because two people today asked me to remove them from my list of contacts and they said it kind of uh, harshly. And I, 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 it's not easy for me because I don't want to irritate people with my, my emails and I'm afraid sometimes I, I succeed in doing just that, uh, although it's not my intention at all. But some people uh, do not respond well. Fortunately, this politician from the Netherlands with his surprise visit restored some confidence in, 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 in what I try to do and, and your presence also. But uh, I, I have moments of doubting because maybe, you know, some people don't enjoy at all uh, this, this uh, avalanche, uh, you know, of, of uh, celebrations. Then I think you sh you are authentic. I feel, and uh, you keep it that way because it attract uh, uh, you know people who think alike. So I mean, let let those who do not uh, like spam uh, uh, feel feel like you're them. Then 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 so be it. But but I think you should keep uh, doing what you're doing, and uh, and I think that's 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 really good. No. Uh, thank you, thank you, Daliana. It really means a lot to me to to receive um, sometimes at least some words of encouragement because I don't have any institutional umbrella above me. I'm not supported by anyone. I do this out of passion. Now, if this you call authenticity, maybe I have it. It's, I, I I don't know, but but uh, it does hurt me because we we, we all want some kind of acceptance you know and uh, uh, when you are isolated and you are not part of a support system is difficult you know we we all need uh, some kind of encouragement and uh, it, that's why I, I i thank you and i appreciate what you said and i i will probably continue but i have moments of uh, you know of disappointment of being disheartened like, you know, I send messages to 2,300 people in the university where I give lectures and people know me and they don't show up, you know, uh, at all. I mean, Anna is the only one and maybe I saw Maria, but out of 2,300 people, it's unbelievable that the level of indifference is incredible and it's, it's hard to, to, to handle it, but that's why, you know, uh, uh, an encouragement that came from you, Daliana, now means a lot to me. Thank you again. You're welcome. Okay, so let's meet again if you want tomorrow or uh, if you can tomorrow, we'll, we'll have a chance uh, the next days. Um, I don't think we lost uh, this afternoon or this, uh, this uh, evening. And uh, yeah, unless you want to say something else, I, I, I hate to end abruptly and it's not my way at all, but I, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, I could stay with you all night, but, I, you know. Uh, no, I mean, um, look, I mean, I want also to connect to what um, Dana just, I want to, I want to connect to what uh, Dana just said. So I, you know, you should not worry too much. I mean, look, the thing what I enjoy here very much is that, um, that that it's informal, right? So you can come, you can come in, you can contribute or not. Um, um, there's not necessarily a, 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 a right or wrong. You know, this is uh, far away from a sort of uh, a university elitism or snobism, if you want to say. Uh, so um, you know, you can just like um, you know, it's like a big brainstorming session. So you can come up with uh, your own thoughts, and maybe they are right, and maybe some of them are more valid than others or not. But I mean, I don't have the feeling that you are here uh, judged in any way, and that makes it incredibly free and and, and, and also um, pleasurable to you know to listen and to join in and then come up with your own stuff. Because you know, um, I remember, for instance, once when when uh, Rem Kola gave a gave a lecture at the Berlach and then uh, one of my classmates or study colleagues said um, she, she, she tried to ask a question and she started very um, complicated and she said like um, once I read in a book I forgot the title and then Rem interrupted her and said like it must have been a book with a lot of pictures 
you know, immediately shutting her down like 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 that. And um, and these sort of um, things I don't like personally at all because you know if you're a young aspiring architect or whatever, you know you have your own thoughts and you want to try them out. You should also get a platform without being like brushed away like immediate like what Rem did with this. Uh, colleague of, of ours from the Lebanon and found, found it highly unfair or, or when you look at uh, you know how Peter Eisenman if you if you google Peter Eisenman on YouTube how he's talking about student work and student uh, crits is, is, is horrible this is like a indecent and you know this is what I like here very much about this possibility of, of, of interacting on a, on a uh, in a respectful way on a, on a human level you know without uh, being judged if if the opinion is right or wrong or whatever you know as long as we discuss it thank you florian well uh, um, let's try to keep it this way yes um, you know we, i actually agree with aliana and florian as well i mean this is a unique thing and you're connecting people from all around the world we couldn't have done that just by going to the university and participating in conferences physically. Um, I mean, this is, and it's informal and as Florian said, it's pleasurable. It's, for me, it's a little bit addictive. I feel guilty if I'm not participating. <laughs> no, this is the biggest compliment. If I could, if I could generate addiction, well, actually, uh, no, Anna, we should talk later about this because um, uh, now uh, when something becomes, uh, if we arrive at the level of addiction, then something is wrong. Uh, no, but I, I know you said it in an in a almost joking way, so I am sure it is not. Uh, but uh, I am addicted to it too. Believe me, I think a day for me without having at uh, this hour uh, some kind of a meeting with you would be a sad day. So obviously it's an addiction. I mean, I was like mad last night, you know, compiling 12 lists with 12 months and you saw that there are 400 uh, birthdays, you know, with 400 architects. So I, yes, I was helped by, a, and I was afraid that that site would disappear. So I had to do it for the whole year. And now I am equipped and stirred up by starting July in, in force, so to speak, with because there are some great architects there, very inspiring, and um, I am very happy I discovered this site uh, that that tells me when everybody was born, you know. Anyway, okay, I, you are very generous, uh, all, all of you, and it, it means a lot to me because I said, you know, I'm not supporting by any by anything. The, the school doesn't give a damn, uh, the, the, you know, it's, uh, so this is done out of, uh, I don't know, of, of love, if I'm not uh, expressing myself in a, you know, uh, old-fashioned way or uh, too sentimental. I don't know. Anyway, but uh, but you are the same, like I am. I, I, you have passion in you and you, ha you, you have sincerity. And uh, I'm grateful I met you, you know. I, 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 if I meet you on the streets now, I know because I saw Florian and I saw Daliana, but um, if there were just the names, I would know Alexandra because I, I know her since she was a student here. And uh, I, I, I don't think Anna would have known if I didn't see her picture. So, uh, and you don't know me. I'm actually embarrassed of that uh, embarrassing letter D. I have to do something about it. Maybe put a picture or change the letter. I hate that big D. It's like, you know, uh, I don't want to <laughs> go further into it. Anyway. Done. Yeah. Actually, I was done. I was joking with Florian that I was going to go to the nearest Amazon to, Ro to Bucharest and send you a, a camera that you can attach on your computer. Oh no, there you are breaking my heart now. No, I can, Jesus, I, I no, really, I, 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 I can, I can do something for God's sake, you know, uh, but <laughs> uh, anyway, I, uh, I, I guess I have to do some, at least put, put a picture there, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I can do that, you know, but I don't, I don't know yet how to do it, but maybe it's not complicated. Let, let me, let me, I'm, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if you should do it because you know that um, I mean, apart from the people who know you um, in, in person, it adds to the mystery of listening to your voice. It's almost like you know Kraftwerk um, playing concerts, but uh, putting up a couple of robots on stage, but not showing their faces. You know, it has something like this, or so maybe a picture, yes, but not necessarily um, from you. You know, well, I mean, but you, Lauren yeah. and I. Have so diverse opinions that even we cannot agree on a profile picture. So, I mean, it's up to you that we, we take it as you are. You decide if you want to put a picture or not, it's fine. Yeah. I just wanted to yeah. offer a different viewpoint on, on the of the picture, yes or no. No, you know. no because I, I don't want to be impolite, you know, to just have the letter. I, I did it because, I, you know, I, I, I was forced to and the system generated, you know, automatically a letter. I could I could put the something or my full name which I don't like. I, I also have to change my name. I have to change everything, not just my name, everything. But uh, that's not your problem. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, let, let's forget uh, you know who is behind that letter or even behind the name. Let's continue our our journey through architecture and culture. And uh, I think something would uh, could happen if. Some people told me, you know, after we attend this, and, and the more people will show up after the exams. Now they are terrorized by the exams at the university. And, but uh, at least the doctoral students to whom I gave lectures, they told me that once the exams are the, and the tests are gone, they will um, attend. So what I want to say is, uh, somebody told me that after they meet uh, on Zoom, they feel more inspired to, to do work and to, you know, so there is some kind of positive effect in some people. So if that happens, then it's worth continuing. And it is worth continuing for me too, because I feel connected with you, you know, and I feel less alone and, and this is very important. Yeah, but you know, this is also something I discussed with Dana because I usually yeah, I go out on a, on a Friday or a Thursday and hang out with my buddies in the, in the local beer garden and have my beers. And this is a lot, little bit also um, now falling away the, thanks to this uh, blasted COVID-19. So, but it's interesting now I have uh, sort of uh, my my uh, beer garden at home and at the same time also talking about architecture. So it's an interesting combination. Problems only I ran out of beer now, so um. <laughs> you have to do something <laughs> about it. Maybe I should go to Amazon and order some beers for you. <laughs> it will not reach us then. It will be heavily taxed, and uh, the tax people, uh, you know, the custom people will drink them instead. <laughs> you know, you know what happens sometimes if people send uh, food chocolates to Indonesia. They open the packages, take out the European chocolate, and put some Indonesian cho Indonesian chocolate inside. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, uh, by the way of this, you know what happened when I escaped Romania, you know, the, the communist country and I ran away to Italy and from Italy I sent on Christmas some presents for my wife who remained in, in Bucharest and our daughter. And I, I bought a dress for my daughter. And uh, so we talked on the phone. I was in Rome, they were in Bucharest and I said, what about Anna? Uh, did she enjoy... Uh, that uh, dress of, uh, of corduroy, brown corduroy. She said, uh, my wife said, uh, well, uh, uh, she enjoyed the dress with, uh, 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 how to call them, uh, <laughs> red spots on a white background, but I don't know what, what dress you are talking about, of brown corduroy. So <laughs> the, the dress I, I bought for her was replaced at the, you know, at the, you know, the Vamal uh, office somewhere, you know, with another dress. They stole that one that I sent, but at least they replaced it with another dress. So it was kind of funny. Anyway, uh, that was a long time ago. In, in the meantime, uh, my wife died in New York of brain tumor. Uh, that, that was eight years ago. Two, 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 two days ago was exactly eight years ago. And my daughter is in, uh, in, in Florida. She's, well, she's escaped Florida now because uh, she's in a vacation, but there is a pandemic there that is uh, going to the sky now, maybe you read, in, in Florida, because of that yeah. governor who is on the side of Mr. Trump and to open the economy and open the bars and open everything. And now the, 
the, the cases of new coronavirus uh, cases are going to the sky. New, uh, it's an explosion of, of, of uh, infection. This is, this, is, this is exactly this point. One must always maintain one's connection to the past and it's easily put away from it. You know? I mean, we had the Spanish flu and we know about the second wave and we know about the third wave and we know exactly why it happened. And if you read the, the history about what happened in San Francisco, uh, when they loosened up everything, you know, this is, 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 is borderline stupid what we're doing because we are actually not learning from our past because we know it's going to happen if you do it. And, you know, still, we have a very good example, a very well documented example about the, uh, about the Spanish flu, what happened with the second and third wave, why it happened. And we're still not smart enough not to do the same mistake. But we are not even respecting the near past. I mean, you know, the irresponsibility of these people who, who you know, it's unbelievable, you know, what is happening. I mean, you know, the United States, the light of the world, so to speak, now has, uh, is, is unable to stop this, this pandemic. And, and it, it brings it to its knees, really. It, and the arrogance of the president and the arrogance of, the, of those governors irresponsible who, they don't care because they have all the health care in the world. They have the means to, you know, defend themselves. But, but so many people die, you know, it's, it's so very sad. Anyway. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Anyway, um, anyway, let's, let's hope, uh, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic will, uh, will end one day because, uh, it is as it is. It is. It is tough. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, again, I thank you for for everything, for presence, for encouragements, for being kind and and, and human and informal, and we'll meet the again if whenever you can. Tomorrow at exactly the same hour, I'll be here. So. No, but I like I like the topic about women, but maybe um, you. Uh, um, the topic about this, sorry, that sounds very stupid. Um, no, uh, women architect, um, maybe we should, I mean, what about Lena Bobardi and, and- Well, I just thought of uh, an issue. Let's, so tomorrow, I'm very glad you mentioned it, uh, Florian, and you have great intuitions. I will also talk about Lena Bobardi, truly a great architect. I, I love Lena Bobardi. So tomorrow we'll talk about Lina Bobardi, Carmen Pinos, and Benedetta Taliabue. It's written in stone. Nothing can change it. <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, most likely see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye, okay, Dalian. Bye. bye, Florian. Bye, bye. 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 So who else is here? Uh, is uh, Anna? I, I I don't see the list, but. Uh, I do something, uh, I see, Alexandra, David, uh, yes, the, the crowd, the usual crowd. Thank you very much, I indebted to, indebt to you. Alexandra, uh, you didn't choose yet from the list in July, you are free to, to if, if a name there attracts you, please feel free to, you can even do something creative, it doesn't have to be necessarily a presentation per se, you could, I, I don't know. And they, uh, I, I emailed, um... Uh, now this afternoon, um, I, I was thinking of talking about uh, Herman Herzberger. Excellent, very good. You you chose uh, nicely. I mean, there are other names there, but Herman is, uh, is a, was very a very good architect. Yeah, it's one of my yeah. I mean, I I like him, so it's one of the people in that list that I personally engaged with and liked. So <laughs> it's, but, it, I chose him because I have more to say about it rather than. Perfect, yeah. Alexandra. So, you know, no one else will, will, will replace you with that. Plus, you know, <laughs> if, if two people want to talk about the same person, that, accept, that is acceptable too. But I'm glad you chose. So we already have three architects that are uh, found, uh, found uh, their admirers. And now, you know, Anna will tell, uh, tell me later, you know, uh, anyway. I think it's nice. And today I was very, very surprised that that politician from the Netherlands uh, showed up, you know, uh, whose name I could not pronounce, but uh, obviously he was, he's a known person in, in the Netherlands since both uh, Daliana and Florian 
knew about him. Maybe he can help me with a constant uh, competition for the new Babylon. I don't know. Anyway, so we did it. Yeah? yeah. And then, by the way, looking forward about Carmen Pinot. Uh, I had the, 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 um, the presentation that you're going to do about uh, Carmen Pinot tomorrow. Yes. Uh, looking forward for that. I, I briefly studied during one semester in Barcelona and I had the, the luck to attend one conference uh, that she was giving at, uh, at the university. And she is really something. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to, to review some, some works from her. Excellent. Very good. And maybe you'll have some, you'll say something yourself. Good. So tomorrow... Maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe I'll also talk about Enig Mirais because he was so involved with both. So, <laughs> yeah. Lina Bobarti, uh, Carmen Pinos, Benedetta Taliabue, and Eric, Eric Mirais, yes. Okay. Okay, so see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Anna. Bye.